Savvy Business Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with our host, Christina Nichman. Our guest today, Raise the Bar, Change the Game with Brian Marcel, founder and chairman of International Barcode System. As an industry pioneer, he is known for expanding the reach of barcode technology to underdeveloped areas of the world. Brian has more than 25 years of hands-on, high-level senior corporate entrepreneurial experience and provides fresh strategies to our audience today. Find out more about Brian and his business at brianmarcel.net. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you this wonderful morning or afternoon in your case? Yeah, great, Christina. Happy Christmas. Hope you had a good one. Oh, my gosh. I had a lovely Christmas. How was yours? Yeah, family over and everything, you know, it's family time, three days worth of lots of people. <laughs> and I'm pleased to say they're all gone now. <laughs> oh, well, I'm excited because we're here today to chat about raising the bar and change the game in everyone's business. That's the name of your book, Raise the Bar, Change the Game. And you're going to help people do that in their business because what did we talk about before the interview? People are so excited to make goals and changes in their life and their business. And before you know it, uh, February hits and all those goals have gone out the window. Um, but you are here to help people change that route and actually um, make some long-lasting positive goals in their business and in their life. And we're grateful to have you here just before the new year gets started to share all those wonderful details. Before we go there, share with your, our audience a little bit about your background in the entrepreneurial world. Yeah, well, I started um, actually in the stock exchange, um, like mm -hmm. Wall Street. <laughs> oh, when wow. sort of 18, it was my grandfather's business, and um, that didn't really suit me. So I went into mm -hmm. commerce selling paper, posted out in South Africa, and uh, came back to England in uh, 1978, mm -hmm. and uh, started if uh, people want to read my book, they could see how I got into barcoding, but that was back in 78 and um, never looked back. So that's what, 35 years, whatever it is, ghastly. Oh no, it's 40 years ago. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Were you, were you one of the pioneers that helped create the barcode system? Uh, oh, I was, pioneer is probably too strong a word, but <laughs> I am an early mover in the game. Remember, uh -huh. in the, it all started in the States, so probably in around 1972, uh -huh. and it got to the UK about 76, I suppose, mm -hmm. and I got involved in 78, mm. so I was very early in, mm. uh, and I'm kind of one of the pioneers, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, as you'll see in the book, uh, we have a, a, a trade association called the... AIDC 100, the automatic identification, the data capture. Mm -hmm. These are the sort of first 100 people involved in the business, all the guys that invented the barcodes, the laser scanners, the this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm honored to be a member of that. Yeah, that's that's wonderful because my my husband and I were just talking before the interview got started about how the barcode system has revolutionized businesses, especially um, businesses that sell products like grocery stores and, and made our lives so much easier and more effective and and uh, less mistakes because now you're not having to enter and put price tags on every single item and enter it into a system. It's just a lot more uh, effective. Well, of course, barcoding eliminates the human person really where yeah. all the mistakes come <laughs> uh, <laughs> and speed things up as well. But of course, never forget the adage garbage in garbage out. Oh yeah. So, you know, you still got to have a fair amount of accurate data going in there to take mm -hmm. advantage of the system. And of course, retail was only the beginning. Now mm -hmm. barcodes are prevalent everywhere in the supply chain in mm -hmm. government and healthcare, hospitality, Everywhere you look, there's a barcode, thank yeah. goodness. Yeah. In fact, now with our cell phones, our trusty cell phones, I, I'll get a coupon in my inbox of my email, and it'll have a barcode that gives me a $10 off or something at Starbucks, and you go there with their barcode, click right into their computer, and bam, you get your coupon. It's definitely revolutionized the way we do business. Yes. I mean, that, that's an interesting code, or we call it a symbology. It's called the QR code, or 
quick yes. response code, which actually started off in Japan uh, to track uh, automotive parts when they cars are being assembled. Mm. Um, and then it was brought over to sort of be a input to a URL on the website uh, to give more product information. So it could be printed on a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And now it's expanded, as you say, into everywhere. smartphones and everywhere. I think mainly because you can read it with your smartphone camera oh. and you can read it at all sorts of different sizes. I mean, if you wander around China or Japan, you'll see these huge QR codes on walls of buildings. Oh, wow. so as you go past in your car, you're supposed to scan that code mm -hmm. and look at whatever product's being advertised at the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, it works. Yeah, absolutely. And what's cool is that you, you talk a lot in your book about how, you know, really you guys started with a business that has helped tremendously. A lot of people you've mentored a lot of people and helped them get to a, a quite a great status in their business. But you talk about how it's never really too late to start a business. Now, what do people have to think about when they're starting a business because not everyone listening in has already started the business some people might be listening in going hey I've always had a passion I want to get started but is it viable could I even start I'm older I'm 40 50 what would you say well I like the word passion mm -hmm. uh, because that's what you need really to start a business I mm -hmm. find with uh, a lot of my mentees they have problems or maybe use as an excuse yeah. uh, to know what to start the business in Mm -hmm. you know, what idea have they got? And they all spend far too much time trying to think up an idea that's going to revolutionize the world. But, you know, how many people can do that? How many people could be a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates or whatever? Mm -hmm. So I say, look, don't worry about the uh, idea. Um, just do something you're passionate about. And, and it's probably been done before, but just do it better than everybody else. Because exactly. if you look at the average company, not the average company, but the companies that are doing particularly well, they're going the extra mile for the customer mm -hmm. um, and trying to innovate. And I think innovation is key. Mm -hmm. Do that every year. And, you know, as you, as, you're, as you go through the life cycle of your company, you probably find things that you can do to disrupt markets and you can diversify or start another company, but at least get going. Mm -hmm. um, and January the 1st, wow, that is a good time to get going, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say so. And, and even if you are in business, here's the one thing I've realized. I'm a consultant. I work a lot in New York, Manhattan, and I've worked for a lot of businesses that, you know, start out ravingly well. They're doing great. They're building quickly. But then as years go past, they start to get a bit... Um, Com complicit. Uh, they're like, ah, oh, you know, it's all good. We don't have to press too much. We got our system going on. But as you said, things are constantly changing in business and in the world. And if you're not on top of it, someone can come right behind you, do the same thing you're doing and uh, take you out of the water. And so that, that one step forward, you said some of the most successful businesses is looking at what are the customer's needs, wants, and desires, and how do we bring it to them in a way that they will just you know be excited about or give them even better service and quality service. Um, and I, I think that's something that even if you're in business right now, you can start to look at how can I innovate and bring my product or service in, in a way to the clients that will be that much better for them. And furthermore, why not go a step further and actually anticipate what they want? Mm -hmm. You know, not just what do they want? Where do you think they'll be in a year's time? And how can you get there before everybody else? Because mm -hmm. as you say, competition is, is terrible these yeah. days. And you just have to keep a step ahead. And I think another thing, a lot of companies overestimate their competition. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can tend to hold them back a bit from uh, making another big leap they'll probably say, oh, my competition's there or getting there, mm -hmm. you know. But in fact, I've found that, that they're not nearly as good as you think they are. Uh, and you can leave them absolutely standing by mm -hmm. making a move that they're not expecting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also you get, if you like, first mover advantage mm -hmm. uh, by getting ahead of them. Uh, even if, it, you know, they can just play catch up. 
if they do actually want to make that move, but they may not. So it's worth the gamble and the risk. And that's the other thing about being an entrepreneur, your mm -hmm. appetite for risk. Uh, if it's not very really great, then don't bother to start a business. <laughs> you're going to be betting the farm and uh, risking all sorts of things through the whole life cycle of that company. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have no appetite for that, don't get started. I don't think that's something that uh, you can actually acquire. Mm. I think in the genes, I think it's something you're born with yeah. to risk or not to risk. Of course, there are different degrees. I mean, just because... Mm -hmm. I like risk. It doesn't mean I'll throw myself off a mountain in a fly suit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all that kind of risk, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> There's risk that you could actually um, accomplish some, um, a possible goal. Uh, throwing yourself a building with uh, no parachute, not a good risk. Uh, no. You know, it's, it's interesting, though, because uh, a, a lot of people um, I've talked to, business owners, they will take the risk, but I think sometimes not look at all the aspects that need to come into play to make that possibility a reality. And I think some of the things that get left behind the most is thinking about the clients and how will this, you know, moving forward affect the clients. And, and I've seen that more and more again, where the clients feel like, I just felt like I was just left in the wind and, and I wasn't a concern at all in the moving forward. So how do you take into whole whatever, you know, risk or, or challenge you're going to take forward to move the business forward, where you take your customers, um, needs and wants, um, into consideration? Well, I think it's becoming more and more um, important now, Christina, because uh, you've got to start, well, not start, but you've got to keep building relationships with the customer. Yeah. Uh, you've got to know your customer. You've got to really get in there. I mean, we, we're in the technology business, so I keep talking about uh, we have to be the customer's trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be able to be invited onto their technical advisory board say yeah. for the three-year roadmap mm -hmm. uh, that we get consulted on that so we've got to make ourselves indispensable yes to the customer because if you think about it, there's not a lot of loyalty these days yes the customer is going to move not necessarily for price but for something that comes along so what makes you sticky mm -hmm. uh, why should they carry on buying from you so building relationships, segmenting your market, uh, knowing who's there, who should be there, and, and just getting in deep and wide with the customer mm -hmm. from a sort of consultative point of view mm -hmm. is the way to go. And I think that's why a lot of uh, customer, uh, companies are now moving to a sort of subscription-based model uh, to try and sell their services uh, like on a on a transaction basis because that guarantees them say the next couple of years income before lifting a finger um, and mm -hmm. I think this is the way business is going to go and you can't do that unless you really know your customer backwards what they need what they want mm -hmm. to need in in a year or so's time and, and just becoming indispensable yeah, it's interesting you've mentioned the subscription basis because I, I've worked with a number of businesses that have that type of model and oh, you're correct. They love, uh, the businesses love this idea because for one, it keeps you viable that you know that we've got a contract with them for two years, one year, whatever. They're in the, they're in the bowl for a year. We know we got this income. But on the other hand, I've, I've gotten some clients saying that, okay, once they got me to sign on the dotted line, I didn't get the service I need on a monthly basis to keep the services running or whatever they're giving me. And so that is so pertinent, which you mentioned before, that you really have to keep that, that loyalty and relationship going. It doesn't end just because you've gotten the, the sign on the dotted line. It's just the beginning. And, you know, I, I, a couple, oh my gosh, probably a couple months ago, I was dealing with one of my clients clients and she was like you know I'm ready to pull I'm so upset and I said once I calmed her down I said tell me the issues what is it and basically once they got them up this was a, um, a service they were providing um, her staff didn't know how to use it they had gotten set up with them over five years ago they now 
her new staff, you know, they, they're not the same people, as you said, people are not loyal today, employees are not loyal. So there's a whole new staff, no one knows how to use the system properly. So they're not getting the benefits out of it that they, you know, paid for. And I said, okay, so what you're looking for really is you need training so you can properly use our system and not struggle. Is that what I'm getting? And she's like, yes. I said, okay, so what can we do to make that happen? Do, do you want to set up some times where our our people can come over and help sit with you for a day or you know, maybe do an online call. And uh, anyway, it eventually got worked out that the people I was working with were a little like, oh, we did this five years ago. We shouldn't have to go over now and do that. I'm like, yes, you do. It's a constant thing. Things don't stay the same. We don't have the same employees. They don't have the same employees. We have to make it where they know that they can set up within maybe once a year um, or so uh, a time for a uh, new training with us. What's new with the system? What, what new features have been added that you can, you know, get most out of for your business? Well, this, once you enter the subscription model zone, mm -hmm. you have all sorts of pressures because uh, if you're a, offering a monthly subscription, uh, you obviously want to add value to the customer and mm -hmm. to yourself. So you've got to keep innovating to add more features or benefits or something mm -hmm. um, to get the customers to carry on signing up with you. Because otherwise, as you say, you'll get this horrible <laughs> word, customer churn, um, uh -huh. and they'll just uh, disappear off your radar. Mm -hmm. uh, you were fortunate that you got a chance to get them back. But uh, yeah. in most cases, they just disappear and that's it. And you may never, ever know why. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of pressure for innovation. Um, it's tough, this subscription model, but it mm -hmm. adds huge value to the company, especially if you want to sell out. It'll add a lot of, um, you know, uh, how many times EBITDA and stuff that mm -hmm. somebody will pay for you. Uh, maybe five more points. You know, so it's really worth doing. Uh, some people shy away from it, actually, because mm -hmm. uh, once you embark on that, your revenue drops dramatically, uh, probably mm -hmm. about 20 or 30% very good example of that is Acrobat, actually, uh, Adobe. Mm -hmm. um, when they switched to a subscription model, I think their revenues dropped about 40% and their wow. shareholders went absolutely wild. It's, oh my God, what's happening? Okay. Um, but then, of course, they, uh, they built it all up on the subscription model. You can't actually buy an Adobe product anymore. I think it's I all subscribed. And, um, and mm -hmm. their multiple is, oh, I mean, they're worth so much money now, much more than mm -hmm. they ever were when they were just selling software. Yeah. Um, and that's, so it's, it's challenging, but, you know, this is, this is the way the world's going, I think. Yeah, you're, you're so correct, Brian. And it's interesting. I love Adobe products. And when they did switch to a subscription base, I was like, oh, I like having the disc. I like having it in my hand. It felt like, okay, now if I switch computers. Uh, anyway, I, I was bummed for it uh, when they went that direction. But I understood from a business perspective how important it was for them to do that and how much they could benefit in the long run. Now, you know, Brian, I'd like to talk about leadership. Because one thing I've seen by working with a lot of businesses is it's a component that's missing. And I think it's a big deterrent to a lot of thriving uh, to businesses thriving is having poor leadership. Uh, what have you witnessed and why is that a problem for a lot of businesses? Yes. Uh, leadership is key. Uh, so somebody, the leader of course is the person at the figurehead, obviously the person that sets the business going. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately for some people, uh, there are there isn't one type of leadership that's effective. There, uh, I think seven or so, as uh, wow. Collins mentioned in his great book, "Good to Great." Mm -hmm. um, there may be others, you know, uh, but whatever work, you know, whatever works. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I think the components are you've got to have a vision, uh, which is a great thing. <laughs> at the beginning of a company because let's face it without a vision you don't really know where you're going or what you're offering um so you're not going to start anyway very successfully um and with that vision needs a plan a business plan mm -hmm. now it doesn't have to be a complicated business plan i mean it could be one page two pages uh, but on that plan, there's got to be like a mission or a, the, what's the purpose of the company? Mm -hmm. What's in it for my customer? Why should they buy from me? Mm. Then it should have some goals in it, maybe five goals for the first year. 
Mm. Um, some strategies to achieve those goals, some action points with some accountabilities and date lines uh, for those strategies. Now, mm -hmm. if you've got a, a good document like that, you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. then you're more likely to be able to sell that to your employees. Interesting. Uh, because they don't want to go into a company uh, that hasn't, that's not traveling anywhere or doesn't know where it's going. I must go back to uh, Jim Collins again. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got this bus, which is the company, and it's headed in a direction. It's got lots of seats in, those, in that bus. Uh, so you need to get people to fill those seats. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it doesn't matter which seat they go in. If they're really good, you can worry about that later. But what does matter is the direction the bus is heading. And uh, mm -hmm. this is how you build a team and a culture in the company. Uh, without, you know, if somebody, if you're in a, a battle mm -hmm. and uh, you're asked to go up a hill and there's machine gun fire all over the face and you've got to take this hill, mm -hmm. um, you won't go up there unless you believe in your leader. Mm -hmm. uh, that you're not going to get shot um, and that you'll get to the top in safety. Mm -hmm. And so you follow him. And so leadership's all about creating followers mm -hmm. and creating the environment and the charisma to get them. And if you're not a leader and you prepared to admit that, but you have a vision, say, mm -hmm. uh, then get in somebody who can execute the business plan for you and lead the company. And you can just be the figurehead. Um, you know, we, we go back to Steve Jobs and uh -huh. Steve Wozniak, you know. Uh, so Steve Wozniak was the techie and Steve Jobs led the company and innovated. But the, the two were great as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, one would execute, one would be a visionary. Uh, and don't worry about giving half the company to that person because it's it's well worth it mm -hmm. uh, they're double axles through history one of my regrets is that i never actually found somebody <clears throat> who would fulfill that role for me mm. uh, whether i wasn't looking i don't know but um if you can find someone go for it quickly yes I love that you mentioned this because one thing i found many years ago i worked at a company um a rather large company doing fabulously well um, right now. But I remember at the time, my particular boss was the type of boss that if we were doing that, that going up the hill with gunfire, we would follow him because he was a super strong leader, but gave us a value and a niche where each of us felt we were very respected in, in our particular, you know, whatever we were providing our niche. Um, and we felt that, you know, he had our back at the same time. So we would stay late, do what's necessary, close, whatever it took to make the job happen. Uh, we would give our all and not go home to our families, you know, on time or stay very late, whatever it might be, um, because of his leadership. And it's something I've, I've not seen in a lot of businesses, but you are so correct. I, I worked for one business as a consultant where the um, person who started the business, a great visionary, had a great vision, launched it around the world, but couldn't take it um, to explode to a multi-million dollar company because of this kind of hold that I, I didn't want to give a part of my leadership um, to someone else. Now, she wasn't a great leader, but a great visionary. And it's sad that had she been able to release the part she's not good at, let someone else let that puppy roll like a Steve Jobs, she could have maybe exploded, you know, much more than she did and, and launched into multi-million dollar business. Um, but yeah, I totally get that. Now, what I'm wondering, let's, you know, I've worked for some businesses that are medium sized, super large. As you get bigger and bigger as a company, how do you make sure you get the right management, supervisors, the leaderships that lead, not at the top, but you know, you have different levels of leadership. How do you make sure they're matching the culture and, and matching the vision of leadership that will bring your company to where you need to go? I mean, how do you do that in the hiring area? Yeah, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. Hiring the right people. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a story in itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, some people just take an hour to hire somebody. Uh, people yeah. like Toyota take five days. Um, mm. it, the, the thing is, you've got to have a process 
Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to be looking for for people to hire uh, 24-7 uh, mm -hmm. because you know, just when you need a salesperson doesn't mean there's a great guy around the corner waiting for you to advertise a job. Mm -hmm. But, a, you know, in a year's time, uh, he might be available. Uh, so you need to track him. Uh, so you've got to have a, a, an HR person constantly uh, putting in a process to keeping you look out for talent, um, interviewing them, even if there aren't any jobs available. Mm -hmm. And of course, the interviewing process is a skill in itself. Um, yeah. I always go for uh, a third uh, experience in, in the job I want them to do, a mm -hmm. third in their qualifications, and a third in the culture. You know, are they going to fit into my company? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important one of all because 85% mm -hmm. of most mergers and acquisitions fail Ooh. because cultures fail to integrate um, and uh, because they, they don't have the skill. You know, if you're putting two companies together, they're bound to have a different culture. I mean, yes. why wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, so how do you manage that? Um, so I think in answer to your question, you've got, let's say, you've got to get in these managers, the second or third tier of management, depending on how big your company is. And you've got to train them up in, in, um, in people skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, to motivate people, you've got to give them a lot of praise and a lot of feedback. Mm. Um, I, I think a lot of leaders forget this. They, they may wander around the company looking to see what's going on, but they, they fail to give praise to people, uh, even if it's something small, mm. and, and feedback, because everybody wants to know they're doing a good job. Uh, and the really good people want to make a difference to the company. And so they want to know that they made a difference to the company. Uh, they want to know that they can experiment without getting, um, I'm just going to use a four, yeah. four letter word. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, struck down, uh, told off, let's yeah. say told off uh, by their manager um, which stifles innovation, frankly. Yes. And we spoke about innovation earlier, so yes. the importance of it. Um, so I, I always have a weekly meetings with my key staff, and uh, normally for an hour, and 50 minutes of that is their agenda. So they can give me all their problems or ask advice, whatever, mm. during that 50 minutes. And then the other 10 minutes is my agenda. And then... I give them the feedback and the direction I think they need and hopefully praise or the opposite of praise, which once again could be a full letter word, which I won't say anything here. Um, and uh, then, uh, I, as I say, weekly for them, maybe monthly for the less important staff. But that does motivate them. And uh, that's part of the culture. And you want your culture um, to reflect your goals. You, the yeah. culture of the company must be aligned with your goals as leader. And then you've kind of got a recipe for a successful company moving forward. Wow. You, I got a lot from you there. And what I'm liking, what you first mentioned about the HR crew is really having a, a um, pulse on what's out there. And from what I'm gathering, really keeping strong with the network, meaning always building people network of good people that could be on call when needed. And that way to, oh, look, someone just dropped out and, and quit yesterday and we need a new salesperson. And now you're scattering around looking for anyone to fill that spot. And, and, and it may not be likely you'll find someone that's phenomenal for that spot so always keeping the doors open and building those network of people that could be on call when necessary and then also the feedback I liked and the praise uh, and that's so interesting you mentioned that because so many places I work at when I first talk to management team and then I talk to employees the thing I get most is I don't feel like I'm being heard that no matter what I do they don't see what it takes for me to do my job successfully and they're not giving me the tools to do that so I feel disheartened and uh, so I think what you're mentioning here that monthly meeting where you not only give praise and, and allow for feedback uh, allows your team and crews to be heard and feel like okay now we're on a path where I feel like I can make some difference 
Absolutely. I mean, I think it's the making the difference that's so important, isn't it? Yes. You've got to go home feeling really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think who the, uh, the leader was who would go around to his staff and he'd say, what have you done for the company today? Uh, and I think that's a really good question. Of course, it puts them on the spot. Yes. But it's very important to get that answer. But it also shows, I mean, it may put them off their stroke a bit, but it also <laughs> shows how, how interested he is in you uh, mm-hmm. as a staff member. You know, sometimes CEOs don't come down from their lofty towers and speak with the high poli. Um, you know, we talk about management by walking around and all this sort of thing. All these things are really important mm-hmm. and build up the culture of the business, the values of the company, and, and serve to get you to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. This has been so fantastic. And I know people can get that much more value by going out and reading your entire book and learn how they can grow their business to the next uh, level, uh, raise the bar, change the game. Where can they get a copy of that? Amazon.com. In fact, Amazon.everything, if they're uh, (laughs) (laughs) listeners here. I mean, they might even get a drone to deliver it within the next 30 minutes. Quick. (laughs) That's right. You can get it straight to your iPhone and listen and start reading it today and get started before the new year. Uh, Yes. And they can go to your website, brianmarcel.net. Yep. Yep, yes. Awesome. And I have all your information there. Brian, I just have to thank you. This has been such a phenomenal information, uh, informative interview that I know are going to help a lot of business owners out there or anyone thinking of starting a business that's been a little timid sitting on the uh, gate wondering if I should get started or not. Hopefully this will get them their juices rolling on um, getting your book and then going forward and making their passion a reality. Well, thank you very much, Christina, and I wish all your listeners uh, a new, uh, happy new year, although I don't know when this is coming out, but uh, I still wish them a happy new year and your good self, of course. And thank you for having me on the show. You betcha. Absolutely. It'll air this week. And I thank you so much, Brian, for coming to Savvy Business Radio and sharing your great wisdom today. All the best. Thank you, Christina. Bye now. Savvy Business Radio broadcasts worldwide via a large podcast network celebrating business owners, entrepreneurs, influencers, and successful individuals. Find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest. Call 732-474-7375 or email Christina at SavvyBusinessRadio.com.